So last lecture was just a very brief introduction to um, mass spectrometry-based proteomics and um, explaining to you a little bit about um, what it can measure. Uh, this lecture we're going to go into more of the technical details of how tandem mass spectrometry actually works and what, what are the different components um, that make up a mass spectrometer. So if you remember we went over this general workflow for a um, tandem mass spectrometry uh, set up last lecture. Uh, so we'll just review it briefly here where you're starting with a sample um, either from a tissue or um, a, um, cell culture um, where you've um, isolated proteins and typically one separates and enriches um, those proteins for uh, based on the types of things one is looking for. Um, and this separation and enrichment can actually be quite extensive. One very common way to um, separate proteins is just like as in a western blot to separate by molecular weight and then analyze different bands of molecular weight to reduce the complexity of the sample. Um, almost universally um, proteins in a sample are digested um, to turn the proteins into peptides. Um, uh, a common protease that's used to do that is trypsin but there are other proteases which are sometimes used. And so then you go from a um, usually fairly highly complex mixture of proteins to a um, simplified and um, a more simple mixture of peptides. Um, these peptides are then typically separated even further and then um, input into the mass spec via an ionization process. Um, after they're an an uh, ionized, uh, they can actually be analyzed via mass spectrometry um, based on their mass to charge ratio and input into a first mass analyzer which is used to, as a separation device to pick out which are the most abundant peptides that are being input to the mass spectrometer at this stage and then select those ones for further fragmentation. Uh, sent into a second mass analyzer which analyzes the fragments of those peptides um, from which one can deduce protein sequence and also post-translational modifications and relate that to the um, amount or quantity of the peptide that was coming into the mass spectrometer. So one of the most common forms of separation in mass spectrometry is liquid chromatography and um, in many cases a liquid chromatography column is the step which is um, interfacing a mixture of peptides um, and the mass spectrometer it itself through a ionization process we'll um, describe a little bit later called electrospray ionization. Um, so a liquid chromatography setup usually consists of many pumps which is taking your sample um, usually diluting it with some kind of solvent um, this solvent composition can change over time, which changes its affinity for the most important part of the chromatography setup, which is the column. Uh, the column is uh, packed with a resin. Um, a common resin for proteomics is a hydrophobic C18 column, but there are many types of columns um, which can separate your mixture of peptides based on various uh, physical chemical properties, such as hydrophobicity or charge, for example. And um, the affinity of peptides for this column can be changed by changing the solvent composition. So um, typically you, in you inject your sample into this chromatography setup. It starts to be pumped through the column. And as time goes on, you can change the solvent composition on a so-called gradient which then changes how your peptides elute from this column. Um, and then by analyzing what comes out of the end of this column over time, we simplify a mixture of peptides into an even a simpler and purer uh, composition of peptides coming out and being input to the mass spec at any given moment. When we input our sample of peptides to the liquid chromatography column, we have to have a way of inputting that into the first mass analyzer. And, um, to, ionize the peptides that are coming off of this column. Um, the method that's used to do this is called electrospray ionization. Um, there are, of course, many types of ionization, that uh, some of which are listed here, but the two of which, which are commonly used in proteomics are the electrospray ionization and so-called MALDI, or matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization, which I'll explain in the next 
two slides. So electrospray ionization was one of the key breakthroughs which allowed um, proteomics to really take off in, in mass spectrometry applications where um, one is able to interface the output of a liquid chromatography column to a mass spectrometer. And um, the idea is actually remarkably um, simple, although technically very challenging, is to take that um, flow output from the liquid chromatography column um, and put it out of a very fine spray needle, which turns the, um, uh, the liquid coming out into droplets. And those droplets are, are subsequently dried. And then with a high voltage being applied, um, between the liquid chromatography column and the input to the mass spectrometer, um, these, these peptides can become ionized and then can um, be input into the mass spectrometer. Um, and this invention, the electrospray ionization technique, was actually awarded the 2002 Nobel Prize because it allowed not only mass spectrometry-based proteomics to take off, but many other forms of of um, mass spectrometry, which depends on separation by a, a liquid chromatography column. Another commonly used form of ionization in mass spectrometry-based proteomics is called MALDI, where you simply embed your peptides in a so-called matrix, which is um, able to transfer charge to your peptides when you shine a laser on the sample. So. Um, you put your sample on a so-called target and shine the laser on it and there's a potential then between the target and the mass analyzer. So a, a laser is shined onto your sample, um, some charges are transferred over to your peptides, um, they become ions, and because of the applied voltage they then travel into the mass analyzer where they can be further analyzed. So after your peptides are ionized, they can be analyzed by a mass spectrometer. Um, and the, the functional unit of a mass spectrometer that analyzes things based on a mass to charge ratio is called a mass analyzer. Um, so there's, of course, several types of mass analyzers. Um, three commonly used ones in proteomics are a quadrupole, a time of flight analyzer, and an ion trap or an orbit trap analyzer. So a quadrupole analyzer um, works in the following way according to this schematic where um, the peptides or ions are um, input into a source like from the electrospray ionization source for example and then they travel through a column where you have four rods um, two of which are positively charged and two of which are negatively charged. So there's voltages um, across these rods and then the voltages are changed in a time-dependent manner so that you can imagine if you're an ion traveling through this series of columns that you um, oscillate then either towards the positive or towards the negative um, uh, nodes in this in this quadrupole and based on the time-dependent behavior that's that's induced on these voltages which can be tuned um, you only allow certain ions um, with, with a particular window of, of mass to charge ratios through the other end um, to the detector. So a quadrupole can act both as a, a filter and also as a detector for certain mass to charge based on our ability to change the time dependent behavior of the voltages applied to the quadrupole. So another type of mass analyzer which is um, typically interfaced with MALDI ionization is the time of flight mass analyzer where um, as described before, um, you shine a laser onto, the, onto your sample on the MALDI target, which then um, induces a, a pulse of ions which are then transferred into the mass analyzer. So if you can imagine then if you have a fixed voltage um, at one end of the time of flight mass analyzer, the ones with higher mass to charge ratio travel at different speeds as the ones with smaller mass to charge ratio. So because we can have a, a very defined start point for when the ionization occurs, and then we can measure the times at which different uh, mass-to-charge ratios um, arrive at the detector on the other end of the time-of-flight 
mass analyzer, we have a way of determining um, how much of each mass to charge is in our sample by analyzing the times of arrival of each time of flight of, of each ion through the time of flight mass analyzer. The last and most sophisticated, but um, it's becoming much more common in um, proteomics in the past few years, is a so-called orbit trap, which is a type of ion trap. Um, as you can see here on the left, it's not a very large device, um, as big as perhaps a common coin. Um, but uh, the way that the orbit trap works is um, a packet of ions is injected into the orbit trap um, with, with a linear velocity. And then um, there's a voltage that, that's um, applied to the inner core of this orbit trap, which then gets the ions to start spinning around the orbit trap. And after a short um, burn-in period, the, ion, the ions reach a stable circular orbit around this orbit trap. And um, the unique thing about the orbit trap is that um, because of its shape, the ions then, although they're spinning around the cylinder, they also oscillate radially across the axis uh, of this cylinder. And the period of that oscillation radially is uniquely relatable to the mass to charge ratio. Uh, so by detecting how these ions are oscillating radially across the orbit trap in time, and then applying some advanced mathematical um, processing uh, to those signals, namely Fourier transform-based mathematics, one can determine what is the mass to charge um, spectra and intensities of these mass to charges of the ions that have been uh, injected into this orbit trap. So I can say there's, there's a lot of good information and videos about this orbit trap system um, on the web link I've put here on the right. So I've talked a little bit about um, separation, ionization, the different types of mass analyzers, but um, I haven't talked how that do you actually couple those mass analyzers together through fragmentation, and um, what are some typical uh, combinations of mass analyzers that one uses um, in a tandem mass spec setup. So a very common um, method of fragmentation is so-called fast atom bombardment or collision-induced dissociation, where um, essentially you, you have your ions in a chamber and you simply bombard them with, with atoms, which induces their, uh, their fragmentation. So in many cases, ions are collided with an inert gas, uh, such as helium, which then just causes them to randomly fragment, um, causing the types of um, fragmented spectra that we that I showed you a sample of in the first lecture. Um, and this is a very common interface between two mass analyzers. Um, one very common uh, combination is a quadrupole with an orbit trap. Um, so the quadrupole um, allows you to filter certain whole peptides through, whichever are the most commonly um, and most abundant ones that happen to be coming off of the liquid chromatography column and being ionized by the electrospray ionization at the current time, um, which you can then select for fragmentation via, for example, fast atom bombardment, and then take those fragmentation products, um, put them into an orbit trap and then analyze what are the different fragments that I have here that were a result of fragmentation of this particular peptide that was selected by my quadrupole. Um, so uh, there's, there's a very nice and beautiful animation of this from Thermo Fisher, who makes a quadrupole or orbit trap uh, tandem aspect system called a Q-Exactive. Um, I, I can highly recommend you to go to the website here I've put on the left and, and check this video out to really see, um, you know, what happens to these ions as they go through the tandem mass, mass spec process. Um, and uh, in a few lectures, um, we actually take you into a lab to show you how does one um, actually use uh, such a QX active machine and um, uh, how does one have to uh, actually prepare a sample so that you can get data and, and input your sample into such a QX active machine. So in the next lecture I'm going to be talking about how you can take this mass spectrometry data and how you can design your experiments in such a way such that you can quantify the resulting data.